going to be a lot of slides, and they're going to be pretty quick in 35 minutes, but um, I'll try to explain them and also develop the arguments that I want to make today. Um, I want to start by saying there are probably three things that I want to say in this 35 minutes and hope that in the course of the discussion as well, you want to make some points about these uh, three things. And the first one is uh, what this presentation covers is what are the causes of the Great Recession that we've best just been through, which is a huge drop in uh, national output of the major capitalist economies across the world, and also uh, the continued for a considerable time, very deep, and the recovery since then has been weak. That, why we call it a Great Recession, the return, the, the depth of the fall and the, the, the weakness of the recovery makes it greater than anything we've seen since, in, since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And the argument presented here is that Marx's law of and theory of crisis explains best what has happened over other theories. The second point I want to make in, the, in this contribution is to say that the Great Recession, in this case, has become a long depression. Most recessions have been lots and lots of slumps, if you want to call them that, or recessions, reductions, contractions in output, increases in unemployment at regular intervals in the capitalist world over the last 150 years or so. There's nothing particular, that is the, the normal nature of capitalism, series of booms and slumps. But sometimes these recessions are deeper and longer, and we can start calling them depressions. And I want to define that a bit later so you can understand what I mean. So the second thing is to say that this Great Recession has become a long depression, which is an argument other people would dispute, but I want to present here. And if that's the case, if we're in a long depression like the Great Depression of the 1930s, will it come to an end, and how? That's the third issue I want to discuss, because uh, will it go on forever? On what circumstances would that come to an end? Now, I first of all want to start, before I discuss Marx's ideas, an explanation for the Great Recession and the crises, to look at some of the positions put forward by the leading economists in the world, Nobel Prize winners, the mainstream, the people who are earning huge amounts of money in the University of Chicago and elsewhere and present advice uh, to the big institutions around the world. Robert Lucas is the top economist in the University of Chicago, Nobel Prize winner. He said in 2003, the central problem of depression has been solved for all practical, practical purposes. Eugene Farmer, who says he was a Nobel Prize winner, he won a prize for explaining that stock markets and generally markets under capitalism are completely efficient, never break down, and will always produce a harmonious result. And he proved this through a... He says, I don't know what causes recessions. I'm not a macroeconomist. So I, but I don't feel bad about that. We've never known. Debates go on what caused the Great Depression. Economics is not very good at explaining swings in economic activity. If I could have predicted the crisis, I would have. I don't see it. I'd love to know what more causes business cycles. That's your Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> now, Ben Bernanke, who was recently the head of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, the biggest monetary institu institution in the world, and conducted policy, is an expert on Great Depressions. That's what he's an economist who wrote all about Great Depressions and recessions. Now, he thinks that the global crisis you've just been through was a financial panic. It was suddenly the banks got into a panic and started not lending to each other and the whole thing collapsed. Uh, that is his argument. We'll perhaps deal with that a little later. So he has an explanation of sorts, but it's an explanation which I think is well inadequate. Now, this is a big, long paragraph, but basically the other side of the mainstream economics is what the Keynesians think. And the, the main one, who, the blogger, Keynesian extraordinary guru is Paul Krugman, another Nobel Prize winner, who won a prize for uh, international trade uh, work. He has now become the leading expo spokesman of Keynesian ideas and an explanation of the crisis. And he says, basically what Keynes says is, is that uh, there's an economy that goes along very nicely, but it sometimes gets a technical problem. It's, uh, as Keynes put it, it gets magneto trouble in the car. The electrics start going a bit wrong. Well, we, once we're clear on that, then we, all we've got to do is sort out this electrical system, and uh, we, once we repair it, 
uh, then the technical problem's over and capitalism and the economies will go forward smoothly again. So it's really a question, as uh, Keynes also said, that basically economics is really like dentistry. Um, we get bad teeth, I come in and fix your tooth, and then everything's fine and dandy. And that's all there is to the problems of economics. It's a bit of a problem sometimes. Dentists aren't all that good at it. Uh, and sometimes they don't notice that somebody's got an abscess which is a bit deeper than they thought. But it, it, that's the, the, the concept which the Keynesians have. Now, there are more radical Keynesians who have argued about what's happened to the crisis. Uh, Hyman Minsky, uh, a Keynesian of more radical nature in the 80s and 90s, basically he says, you know, it's, it's not enough. Capitalism is inherently unstable, unstable. Actually, it's not capitalism as a whole that's unstable. It's the financial sector. When people are lending money to each other, when they're speculating in markets, when they're using uh, and money is being, uh, debt is being run up by the big banks and institutions, that's an inherent instability, and it will come crashing down at a certain point. Uh, there's a, obviously a grain of truth in that argument, and that's a much more radical view, which is not, by the way, that would say that only about 10% of professional economists would even accept Minsky's point of view. Uh, the majority of the left in the trade unions and labor movement internationally around the world think Minsky has got, got it right. Uh, those of us who, go, who are a bit more radical in the Marxist stream get not, not really the coverage that, on that argument. Steve Keane is a, a modern Minskyite, if you like. A very, uh, uh, also quite explains very clearly how, as he says here, capitalism is inherently flawed being prone to booms, crises, and depressions. This instability, in my view, is due to characteristics that the financial system must possess if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. So it's the issue of the financial system, as far as Minsky and, Ke and uh, Keane, the more radical Keynesians are. It's not the system of production for profit. It's not private property. It's not the market's instability in the productive and investment areas, it's the question of the financial sector and the banks. That's what they think. Now, where does profit fit in there? Well, nothing has been mentioned about profit. And it seems to me a rather basic thought, and I would have thought that most economists and perhaps anybody would accept that uh, uh, the world produces for a profit. Companies produce not to make things or s provide services that people want. That's a byproduct. Their aim is to make money. I mean, that is supposedly how efficiently... Uh, things get done. So that unless there's a profit, nothing will get produced and nothing will, no, you won't be serviced wherever you want it, even if it's in Pret, unless Pret can make a profit. So, and yet, there is no instance, no discussion whatsoever of the role of profit in the process of these crises. If we have a con recurrent crises in capitalism, recessions, and even deeper ones, depressions, how, how, how does profit play a role in that? And yet that's the driving force behind the whole process. In the Keynesian uh, economic system, there is hardly a mention of profit. We don't start with profit. We start with spending, and we start with investment. We don't start with profit. Somehow people are spending an investment and, uh, and investing, and then suddenly they're not spending and investing. And there's no real explanation, certainly not from a profit point of view, of why. Um, now, the, the fashionable theory at the moment is that we that the crises of the Great Recession was because we've got a, a extreme inequality has been growing across the major economies of the world. So profits have been rising, or the wealth of the very rich has got bigger and bigger, and the majority of us, at the uh, control over wealth and, and income, has fallen. You can see that this is just a quick measure of inequality in the major economies, which has risen from 1970 to now. Uh, this has become a very fashionable argument. So... Because wages are down and profits are up, there's not enough money for pe to people to spend, and therefore we eventually get into a crisis. Although, apparently, uh, you can have the whole period of inequality where nothing happens and, and the economy goes forward, and then it comes uh, uh, stumbling down. So is it inequality that's behind the Great Recession? Well... <laughs> there you go. This is a quote from uh, some fellow Marxist economists... Uh, Dumoulin Levy in France, and they looked at the whole thing and they said, well, actually, if it was a question of inequality, if it was a question that wages are being held down and profits are going up, and therefore wages, there isn't enough wages to spend, then we would expect a process of underconsumption. In other words, uh, consumption would be held down and then uh, capitalists would not be able to sell their products because workers can't pay for them and uh, spending is too low. Uh, well, uh, 
the other ar- side of this argument is, yes, but what happened was, because wages were held down, then people, households started to borrow a lot more. They started to raise debt. So they, if they wanted to get a house, mortgages were, they increased their mortgages, they took out more credit, and that's how they kept things going. But once the household debt had built up, that would be uh, reach a point where it's like, like a house of cards, a house of debt is the argument presented, uh, and so it would become uh, crashing down at a point. Well, uh, some economists have looked and they found scant evidence for saying that if you, to, to correlate between inequality, debt, and crises. And if there seems to be n- little, little uh, concrete empirical evidence between the facts uh, of those two things. And if we look at the data, now here's an, this is the US, we see what has happened since 1997, consumer spending has shot up while workers' wages have been, as a, as a share of the total output, have been declining. So throughout this period from 1977 to 2007, spending continued to rise despite wages being a smaller share. That was partly due to the increase in debt, but it also means that spending was quite sufficient. That couldn't have been the reason. It couldn't have been the reason for the crash in 2007 onwards if it was a, if it was a question of decline in spending. That's the, of consumer spending in particular, which is basically the position of the Keynesians, that we, we don't have... Uh, enough consumer spending, there's a crisis in spending, and then you get a slump. Well, there's no evidence to show that there was any decline in spending in the US, and that applies to other countries. And in fact, even during the the slump itself, it didn't fall very much. As I say, the latest uh, uh, argument is it's all a question of debt. Here is two mainstream Chicago economists who've got a book out called The House of Debt at the moment, and they say recessions are not inevitable, They are not mysterious acts of nature that we must accept. Well, I think that's a start. (laughs) Instead, recessions are a product of a financial system that fosters too much household debt. Excessive reliance on debt is our culprit, but it can potentially be fixed. We don't need to view severe recessions and unemployment as an inevitable process. We can determine our own fate, and that's probably true. If we think it's just a question of too much household debt that then gets too much for people to service, then all we've got to control is to control the amount of household debt that people have. That might mean they won't be able to get their house or their home or their flat, but it doesn't matter. At least it controls the economy. So it's simply a question of controlling the amount of debt, these economists would argue. Well, I don't think any of these arguments are adequate or sufficient to explain what both recurrent crises and slumps and recessions in the capitalist world, not just in the US, but everywhere, and also this particularly huge one, this Great Recession, that we've just been through from 2008 to 2009, about 18 months, a huge fall before there was an end to it. Now, I would argue that we need to look for what Marx said 150 years ago. He began to analyse the nature as crises began to become clear as a regular occurrence, even on, on his radar screen, that we needed to look at the nature of profit and what's happening to profitability in an economy, and is there a process going on which causes uh, a a regular process of crises as a result? Now, Marx said that the most important law of political economy, by that he meant all the other economists should be aware too, is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall under capitalism. And this is the, the most important law that Marx wanted to outline. And I you can't probably read this, but um, I'm just, quickly the law says that capitalism, capitalists obviously competing with each other to make profits. That's where we start from. They're not competing to make things that we need, only to make profits. They must become more efficient to do that after a certain point, and then need to raise the productivity of their workforce, reduce the costs, uh, and so they can take advantage over other capitalists. Now, they can only really, in the end, do this. They can squeeze us. They can make us work long hours. They can uh, put us on all kinds of exploitive process. But the real way to raise productivity is to introduce machinery, mechanization, other, other ways in which increases the productivity of each individual worker. So if they start increasing the amount of mechanization relative to the amount of workforce they've got, then there's going to be a tendency for the, the cost of all that means of production, technology, and so on, to outstrip the cost of wages. Now, Marx called that ratio between uh, the amount spent on means of production, technology, and on wages, he called that the organic composition of capital. And his basic argument was that the organic composition of capital has a tendency to rise over the long run in history. And when it does so, then 
it will automatically mean if the rate of exploitation, so if each of you are working and you get, there's more and more money being spent on the machinery, but that, you, you're still just providing, you're just getting the same share of the output that's before. There's no change. You're not getting a bigger share. You're not getting a smaller share. So the rate of exploitation of each worker isn't changing. If you're spending more and more on machinery as opposed to labor, then inevitably the rate of profit will begin to fall. This is the tendency, as Marx called it. But there are, there are a number of counter tendencies. Yes, we can, you know, perhaps the, the capitalists can get the rate of exploitation up, get their profit share out of the total output of productivity up so that they can compensate for this tendency for the rate of profit to fall. That's one thing they can do. It's a class struggle between the workers and the capitalists over the share of the output. And if uh, uh, the capitalists are reducing their labor force, therefore they're getting less profit because only labor can produce it, on the, they may be able to increase the share that they get from each or individual worker, and to compensate for that. And so, but eventually, Marx says, eventually the rate of profit will still fall because the rate of exploitation will not increase sufficiently to overcome the rise in the organic composition of capital. The other way is that each time you introduce a new piece of technology, perhaps it's cheaper because it's, you know, instead of being a huge, great uh, main, mainframe computer, now it's a tiny little chip inside a tablet which does the same thing. And may, they, maybe the cost of that is a lot less. Maybe it isn't. That's the point. And over a period of time, we would say that although it could reduce uh, the, the cost of mechanization through new technology, it also means you're getting rid of more labor to do so. Uh, and as a result, probably and inevitably, eventually, the organic compositional capital will rise again. So every, all the counteracting factors can't overcome a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. So over the long run, there's going to be increasing organic composition capital, in other words, an increasing cost of machinery against labor, and thus profitability tends to fall, and capitalism, because the profitability for each new process of investment is getting lower and lower, it tends towards the, the crises. Now, that really just suggests to me, if I'm thinking of a rate of profit falling, that it's really just a process of grinding slowly to a halt. And I want to say that's not what we're saying, because I'll come to that in a minute. It's not a process of coming down to stagnation from a high profit to a low profit. It's a process of boom and slump, but we know that's the case. So this, the law, as, it's, as I've explained it so far, doesn't really tell us that it's a crisis of booms and slumps. It tells us there will be a crisis, but a crisis more of stagnation. Now, I want to bring up quickly uh, Thomas Piketty, who is the flavor of the year, uh, the biggest selling book on Amazon ever, or at least nonfiction anyway. I don't know what, what the others are. But uh, an economics book of 677 pages, nobody's ever written that long, uh, since Marx's Capital. And surprise and surprise, he's used the same name. It's capital in the 21st century, which hints that capital in the 19th century is now well out of date. And thanks to Thomas Piketty, we have capital in the 21st century. One of the things that Thomas says, apart from showing us very clearly how inequality of wealth and income has been growing, particularly in the last 30 or 40 years, is that the rate of return on capital, if you like, profitability, is a central concept in many economic theories. You, I'm surprised because I've just shown you it isn't. Uh, <laughs> in particular, Marxist analysis emphasizes the falling rate of profit, an historical prediction that has turned out to be quite wrong. Well, uh, let me just show you this graph. <laughs> Now, this is the work of uh, Esteban Maito from Argentina. Um, I've pinched his, uh, well, I've, I've doctored his graph, but the data's the same. And this is the world. He's taken 14 countries, and he's worked out a rate of profit that combines the world. It's not the US, it's not the UK, it's the world. It includes Argentina and God knows what. Um, and this is 150 years. So at the time Marx puts forward the idea that the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is uh, the most important law of political economy in the 1850s and early 1860s, we can actually get a graph from Esteban Maito which shows what happened to the rate of profit. Contrary to what Thomas Piketty says, I think it's pretty clear that it fell. Um, and uh, perhaps his Marx's law it does hold uh, up uh, uh, empirically. Of course, it's not in a straight line, as we can see, and as I've doctored, there are different periods where it rises and different periods where it falls, and they're obviously very important. And just think of the period that we've just been through, the so-called neoliberal recovery period, 
right down the end there, after 150 years, a little bit of a recovery. So maybe we may have short lives, and I start actually in the crisis period, so I've, I had a good time there uh, in revolutionary politics. You guys, or some of you anyway, uh, younger ones, might have been in the neoliberal recovery period, which isn't so great. Uh, um, but now, in my view, we're in a new period from about the, the late 90s onwards. On the rate of profit, on the basis of looking just at the rate of profit, we're now in a new crisis period uh, for world capitalism. This is world capitalism, not just the US. Um, I just, uh, these, are my, these are my graphs, which are obviously a bit messier than Astaban's, but concentrate on the US from 46, the post-war period. Uh, and I've only got 10 minutes left, so I'm just about, don't worry, I'm only about one-tenth of the way through. Uh, <laughs> and you can see the same fact that the rate of profit has been falling since the Second World War on a secular basis, but not in a straight line. Uh, and certainly from the period of the uh, mid to late uh, 1970s and certainly the 1980s, we can see a rise in the rate of profit, which has sort of petered out in the last few years. Um, I won't go into that one, but actually to the data, I'll put this on my blog so you can want to, you want to look at the data. And here's the neoliberal period, which is just this last uh, 30 years or so. So you can see the rate of profits rising in this period, which is against Marxist law, isn't it? Well, it's not completely against Marxist law, because Marxist law was if the organic composition of capital rises, on the whole, over a period of time, it, the, the increase in the rate of surplus value, which in this one is the green line, would not be sufficient to stop the rate of profit falling. But in the neoliberal period, it's all the other way around. We have, first of all, uh, we have the rate of profit here, which is the, the blue line, is rising. Why? Even though the rate of surplus value is also rising, that's part of the reason, but the main reason is that the organic composition of capital has been falling during the early part of the neoliberal period. Through mechanization, it's been cheapened, the high-tech revolution of that period. So you've got a rise in the rate of profit. From, from about the late 1990s, the organic composition of capital starts rising, and even though the rate of surplus value is rising, the green line, in the last 10, 15 years, that has not been sufficient to stop the rate of profit starting, at least flattening out and, pro and, and beginning to fall. I've done a world rate of profit, the same argument. You get uh, the big crisis of profitability from 60 to 75, and then the rise in the neoliberal period, which even in the world comes to an end in around about the late 1990s. And we've either flattened out or fallen. The, the red line is the top capitalist economies. So the rate of profit has been, un it's been falling prior to the Great Recession. This is the, f the point that I want to make. And when we, we can see it a little bit more clearly, to use Mito's da uh, data again, for the world, we see the huge fall in the 1970s, the neoliberal recovery, and then from the 2000s, late 1990s, the rate of profit begins to fall. And we can see that it falls very sharply during the Great Recession itself. I'll skip that one. Can we predict then, can we predict using Marx's law of profitability that we'll have a crisis? Well, uh, here's a quote. There's not been a coincidence of cycles since 1991. And this time, unlike 1991, it'll be accompanied by a downwave in profitability within downwave in Pondratia cycle. That's probably not, we have not discussed that. It's all at the bottom of the hill in 2009-10. That suggests we can expect a very severe economic slump of a degree not seen since 1980-82. Of course, sometimes you get them wrong. On this occasion, it feels a bit better to get it right. Or well, not so good when you got into it, though. And what I want to show about this, not just the question of the rate of profit falling and becoming stagnant, but the profit, rate of profit falls, and then it begins to drive down the mass of profit. This is the cycle of the profit. So if we start on the right with the yellow box, rate of profit falls, eventually leading to a fall in the total amount of profit and new value being produced by capitalism, and then you get a crisis in production. This produces a collapse in investment. Capitalists stop investing. The weakest ones go to the wall. They go make bankrupt. Then they lay off the workers. When you lay off workers, workers have, get no wages, so consumption collapses, and you have what the Keynesians call a lack of effective demand. The Keynesians say we start with a lack of effective demand, and then all else goes back the other way uh, to profit. But actually, it's this way, and this is the way that makes sense. 
This triggers a collapse in financial markets. That's where Ben Bernanke comes in. He says the crisis is due to blue one, the blue bit. Uh, the Keynesians say it's due to the green bit. Uh, ben Bernanke says it's due to the blue bit. But actually, behind that is the process of profit. Eventually, the, sufficiently, the, the economy is reduced in size. The mass of profit begins to rise again, which is what happened from 2009 onwards. Then you get a, a bit of the rate of profit, which hasn't happened yet, really. Uh, and then you get, enter a whole new period of boom. But it hasn't happened. And you can see here that profits, well, I haven't got time again, profits lead the investment process, and then they lead it into the crisis, and then they lead it out of it. But this hasn't happened this time to lead it out of it sufficiently to get profitability up because we're now, in my opinion, in a long depression where it's increasingly difficult to get profitability up to have a new sustained period of, say, 10, 15, 20 years of capitalist uh, uh, growth based on higher profitability. And where Shark makes the same point. This is a schematic diagram. We're obviously not going to take all this in now. It's in the blog. It will be in the book. But... You can ha that's what depression recessions are like. That's 1974 one. Oop, oop, oop. Double dip, 1980s. You get two whips. Depression, however, is like that. It comes down and doesn't recover to the old growth rate anymore. That's the distinction that's made here. And if we look at the three depressions that we've had, the 19th century one was like that, against trend growth in GDP. The Great Depression was like that, and you can see the only way it got back in the end was due to the war in the 1940s. And that's currently how we look in this one. I'll skip those. You can see a weak investment process here. This is investment in the major economies. And the red line is where we were oh, eight years after the, the slump started. Uh, the process, you can see, is still very, very weak compared to other, other recessions. So that makes it different. Investment has collapsed. In the 2000s, we're actually negative on gross investment in the major economies compared to, the, look at the 1960s, the, the, the amount of investment growth there was in that decade. Then it was lower in the 70s, a bit higher in the 80s in the neoliberal period, a little bit lower in the 90s. In the 2000s, capitalism is not investing at all in productive investment. And why? Because most of the economies of, of uh, capitalism have got lower profitability since the crisis and have not recovered uh, to uh, change that situation. And that applies to the UK just as much as anywhere else. That's the official figures on the net return in capital in the UK. And you can see profitability, which is on the right-hand side of the scale, the red line, was up around 14 or 15%. Before the crisis, it's dropped, dropped down to 11. It's not really recovered. And therefore, investment in the British economy, business investment in productive sectors has not improved. The other factor that's making it difficult is that debt that we were talking about before still remains very high. Not just household debt. Uh, you can see how much it's increased in the US during the period of the neoliberal period. But also, and that created that bubble which has now collapsed in housing. But also, capitalist own debt, not household debt, not just mortgages, but company debt is massively high compared to where it was in the 70s and 80s. And that's a real burden upon companies all over the world, particularly in the major economies. Uh, this is not my work, but this is the work of Peter Jones in Australia. He took out all the fictitious, the debt part, the profits that have come from uh, buying and selling debt, speculating on stock markets, buying government debt, and looked at just at the profitability of the productive side of the capitalist economy. So the Although we saw a huge debt and the profit go up during the neoliberal period, you can see if you strip all that out, it was all speculative profit. It was, it was fictitious profit. Actually, the profitability of the productive sector remains incredibly weak and at new lows. No wonder the business investment has not picked up. And that's why the, the financial sector can't uh, get things going again. The banks can't lend. There's, nobody wants to borrow. Or they've either got enough cash and they don't need it, and the banks are in too difficult a position. So we've got... You can see in the U.S. case, there's an investment slump taking place. There's no pickup whatsoever. Now, I'm nearly there. Two minutes to do the final bit. Can capitalism get out of this depression? Because it is a depression. And Marx says there's no permanent crisis. If values are sufficiently destroyed in a slump, then profitability will restore and accumulation will pick up. And assuming that the working class does nothing about this, then capitalism can revive. Um, does it require a world war? Well, the Great Depression seemed to require a world war 
to get capitalism out of that crisis. The Long Depression of the 19th century, which used to be called the Great Depression before we got the Great Depression, uh, didn't, it came to an end to about the 1880s and 1890s. There was no world war. Yes, you had an imperialist rival, which took, and led to perhaps the First World War some 20 years later, but you couldn't say that the economic re revival required a war. So it isn't necessarily the case that there would have to be a war. And I think this current winter, this long depression, will come to an end, but not, probably not through a world war, hopefully not. Uh, and failing a successful revolution in any major economy, then it's going to come through profitability being re-established, probably through another slump before the end of this decade, creating the conditions for higher profitability and using the new technologies, which we know are all floating about and were used after, in, during the Great Depression. And when the war ended, whole new technologies led to the, the growth in the golden age after the, to the war. So unless uh, we replace the mode of production that operates with this recurrent crises and slumps with one in ownership in common and democratic plan for the world, then we will continue with these crises. We'll continue with the high levels of inequality that Mr. Piketty has pointed out. We'll continue with the poverty. We'll continue the rec recurrent crises. And, of course, we will continue destro fast destroying our nature and, the, and the, the world. And it's in it and creating the climate change and global warming, which threatens to uh, destroy great parts of the world, particularly the poorest parts, uh, by th through extreme weather and other things over the next 20 or 30 years. But yes, this depression will come to an end. It will either come to an end because the working class ends the mode of production, or if it doesn't, then su the sufficient amount of depression and slumps will create a new period of profitability. And if that takes place, I won't be here to discuss that next time. Yes, just a, a brief question. Um, one of the, the biggest differences between this Great Recession this time around and the previous ones, the end of the 1800s and the 1930s, is the way the ruling class has made us pay for the crisis. You know, I think in, in Britain, kind of wages have gone down between 13 and 18 percent, I think, you know, since 2005 or, or whatever. And that just really did not happen. They did not get away with that before. Now, they tried, didn't they? You know, didn't they do the same thing? Didn't they try to scapegoat, you know, disabled people and unemployed people and make it all, you know, and, and blame, blame it all on foreigners and whatnot? Why have they gotten away with it this time? Maybe that's not a question for an economist. But, but the question for an economist is, if they really get away with this, you know, um, you know, okay, assuming that there's no revolution, uh, revolution or mass strike or whatever, if they really get away with this, how does that fit into this equation? You know, wages going down, 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 um, profitability not going up, up, up. How, how's this going to pan out? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Martin Upchurch from Bristol. Um, just one question, really. If you compare the Long Depression and the Great Depression with the current depression, one significant difference is the role of the state um, in terms of investment is much greater. Uh, and I think that probably has two implications. Uh, the first implication is that the state can um, uh, compensate to a certain extent for the lack of private investment. And so that's worth commenting on, I think, in terms of uh, the, the role of the state and how it can ameliorate the recession. But of course, the, the, uh, um, the downside of that is if the state does invest and compensate and ameliorate, it doesn't allow that bigger last slump that you talked about, which will write off capital to take place. So this seems a bit of a, a paradox and a bind, which uh, uh, the economy uh, on a world scale seems to be uh, stuck in. So perhaps if you could comment on that point, it would be... Thanks, comrade. This comrade here will be followed by the guy over there. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Heike. Um, first of all, I'm, I agree with the, with the economic analysis of all of it, and I just remember when they decided to invent uh, the word uh, double-dip recession, I couldn't bloody believe it. You know, they're inventing new words, just not to name the, the devil by its name, really. Um, but there's, I, I've got one small problem, um, and this is how we conceptualize of this crisis. Um, as still in uh, sort of periods within and of themselves. Now, I would argue that actually the crisis started much earlier than it didn't start in 2008. 
it started, if you want to put on a date, perhaps in 1997 with the Asian collapse of the crisis, because crisis was within the system from there on expanding within the system. It hit Argentina and, and Brazil immediately. Argentina never really came out of this. Um, and so on and so forth. It started expanding from there on. You could also argue neoliberalism actually has been a configuration of crisis all, the lo all along. And that's where my next problem comes in a little bit. If we're talking about crisis and slum as, as, as sort of interchangeable terms, the same thing, it's, I think that's a problem because I think we also need to understand that there are dynamics to this crisis and it's a crisis of neoliberal capitalism really to be honest, it's, if it's a systemic crisis. And then we also need to understand it's not just an economic crisis, it's also political, social, even cultural crisis, which, which with quite severe consequences and consequences that uh, the left, for instance, has to deal with and has to analyze and look at. So I think we need to think crisis, the term, the concept of crisis through a bit more carefully. Thank you. This comrade will be followed by um, the guy here. Uh, yes, I agree with the speaker that most economics has been very bad at predicting what is going to happen in the economy. Uh, and I also agree with Michael Roberts that the tendency of the rate of profit to fall has got to be part of the Marxist armory in understanding what's going on within the economy. Uh, because the graph that Michael showed, uh, I've never seen a graph quite like that, but um, you, know, you can't dismiss a graph like that. Um, however, uh, my major criticism of, of the way that Michael put his case forward would be that he's abstracted away his economic information from what is happening in the class struggle. And in particular, you know, it, it would help to see um, some kind of empirical information about what was happening in terms of the level of combativity of the working class, in terms of what was happening with strikes, in terms of what ideas the working class uh, was carrying around in its head. Um, and I think um, I would put it differently from Michael when he says that the working class needs to be persuaded to end this mode of production. Um, I, I don't think that would mean much to most of the working class. Maybe I'm being patronising. Uh, the way I would put it is that we should try to end... The working class should try to end the austerity. And I think that that would be more or less equivalent to ending the capitalist mode of production because the whole of the European bourgeoisie is operating an all-out class war, austerity, against the working class in Europe. And I think that politically what we should be aiming for is an indefinite European-wide general strike against the austerity. Okay. Thanks, comrade. This comrade will be followed by the woman over there. Um, Duncan Smith from Edinburgh SWP. My question is really why the crisis has taken a particular form in, in, in different countries, even within Europe and at different times. I remember during the crisis in the 1980s in Britain under Thatcher, your impression was of massive uh, unemployment. Your factories closing down, whole industries closing down for that matter. You know, in great battles with, the, with major trade unions, which unfortunately we lost. Um, in this period, it seems to me in Britain that, that uh, there isn't that level of unemployment in, within the UK compared with, say, Spain. We have this massive level of youth unemployment, which, is, which has contributed to the massive radicalisation radicalization in Spain. I just wonder why is it different in different periods and different countries even within Europe because my feeling is at the moment that within the UK companies are tending to hang on to labor rather than shed labor easily as they seem to do in the 1980s. What's the reason for that difference? Okay thanks comrade. Um, the next speaker will be followed by yeah you can go there. Um, yeah, I think it's plain to see now that the so-called recovery is not really a recovery, but a property bubble um, which is actually put in the UK, which is actually pushing um, millions even further into poverty in, in some cases in, in terms of rising rent prices and the rest of it. Um, on your blog, Michael, you argue that this will um, eventually stimulate growth in the real economy in the sort of not-too-distant future, um, but that once the Bank of England raises interest rates, um, which have been kept very low, um, the next crisis will soon be on its way. So my question is, how severe do you think the crisis triggered by the impending rise in interest rates is going to be? Um, and also, do you think that we'll see um, a serious collapse of, of the housing bubble in the UK this time in a form similar to the US, um, with a serious drop in house prices in the South as well as the North? Thanks. Thanks, comrade. 
The next speaker will be followed. Yeah, uh, just two quick points, which I think uh, quite nicely sort of supplement uh, the rate of profit thing, um, which is that I think part of the confusion around uh, this crisis has been the tendency to view it as, as a financial crisis and a crisis that originated in the financial sector. So people say, you know, can we still use these sort of methods of analysis when actually the economy's changed so much, you know, industry's fallen, whereas finance has taken on a much bigger role. And actually, I think the way to see this, I mean, I, whilst I would maybe put forward the argument that it is a crisis sort of, if you like, with financial characteristics, I think that actually when you see the rise of finance, and, and finance has been in the ascendancy throughout the last 40 years, it's a symptom of, some, of a much deeper crisis. Um, it, you know, the reason why I think capital flows into the, the financial sector is because profits are so low elsewhere. And whilst you can get these short-term bubbles, uh, these so-called sort of fictitious profits, over time it all comes crumbling down. And the second point is that um, we talk about sort of the organic composition of capital falling. And, and of course, historically, a way that this has happened has been with, uh, with war, with the wholesale destruction of capital. Now, the other way to, uh, for capital to fall, for constant capital to fall, is through mergers and bankruptcies in which the, the, the less profitable capitals go broke and, uh, the, you know, the factories are bought up, they shed unproductive machines or whatever. And, in fact, I think the... If I'm not wrong in saying, maybe Michael can speak on this, the last 40 years really has been marked by an unprecedented level of bankruptcies and mergers. And, yeah, I mean, I'm curious to hear whether that that may be uh, added to, to the analysis. Thank you. Thanks, comrade. Yeah, a couple of points. First of all, because I don't think anyone said it yet, but I think it's worth saying that Michael Roberts' blog is an absolutely fantastic resource that everyone should have a look at if they want to understand what's happening with this crisis. For me, the absolute hallmark of good political economy is drawing together the theoretical legacy that Marx leaves us with the empirical picture of what's happening today. Uh, and Michael is, without compare, the, the person who's doing the best work on this stuff. So I really recommend his blog. Uh, so, secondly, uh, I, I just wanted to raise a question about profit rates. Because one of the things that I think we do have to have a debate about is whether we can talk in terms of a profit cycle. Because it, to me, that sounds much, much too much like an automatic process in which profit rates go down and up in some kind of cyclical pattern. My view is much more that what actually restores profit rates in a slump is the process of destruction and devaluation of capital through bankruptcy, collapse of firms, and so on. And one of the features of the current um, uh, long depression is actually the bankruptcy rate is very, very low. If you look at Britain, if you look at America, you look more generally. And I think part of the explanation for this is precisely the action taken by states, and in particular central banks, have played a colossal role in this since the crisis broke. And by putting the uh, world economy on life support system, you can actually keep, um, stave off the, the deep slump that will be required to solve the problems of capitalism, but the price of that is sending the economy into a long, long recession. And that's why people now are talking about secular stagnation, a phrase that has been... Um, revived in, rec in, in recent weeks to describe what's happening in America and Europe and elsewhere. If that is the case, and I think we're in, a ver for, in for a very, very long period, a weak growth, but also critically very, very fragile growth. I think that's important because actually something Tr Leon Trotsky said is that the key things are not whether the economy is booming or whether the economy is in slump. From the point of view of the working class, it's the turns in the situation that tend to generate struggles. I think for, we're in for a long period of weak growth, but very, very sharp turns in the situation. Those turns will open the possibilities of workers beginning to struggle and fight. Thanks, Joe. The next yeah, I'd like to ask, please, about the role of hedge funds, because if you take one company, Boots, for example, which is the largest chemist in this country, about 10 or 12 years ago, it paid £200 million corporation tax in a year on its profits. It then got taken over by a hedge fund, and now it makes hardly any profit because it's been loaded up with debt, and it's based... Uh, for tax purposes in Switzerland, and it now pays under £10 million in uh, tax. Um, so, you know, what is the rate of profit there, and how is it fiddled? And the other thing is that so far as 
these vast sums of money flying around the world, which are quoted on the news every day, it seems that hedge funds are speculating in commodities. Now, if we're talking about the rate of profit, I can understand when you extract oil, you can work out the rate of profit. But if the cost of oil, when it is imported, is completely different because of speculation, how does this affect the rate of profit? And it's not as a result of workers expanding energy or machinery being involved. Thanks, comrade. Right. Um, thank you, comrades. Sorry, those things always intimidated me. Um, as I have mentioned in one of the previous um, economics um, lectures, so say, meetings, I, unfortunately, due to the education system and young age, uh, suffer from acute ignorance of Marxist economics. But... I do know my fair share about the conventional bourgeois economics, uh, about which I would like to speak for a little bit, because one has to know the enemy. Um, now, I would like to say what the bourgeois economists think causes recessions, because it's actually quite interesting just how precise and to point they can get about it. So, we get the classical economists who tell us it's basically act of God. Then we get neoclassical economists who... Uh, like Alfred Milner and uh, Professor Pingo, who tell us it's um, high wages. Then we get Keynes, who tells us all manner of things. It's animal spirits, uh, AD, uh, business cycle, all manner of different things. Then we get Professor Hayek, who tells us it's toxic investments. Then we get um, Milton Friedman, who tells us it's, all, again, all manner of stuff, uh, monetary policy. Then we get the bubbles. And then, recently, we got a Nobel Prize winner who tells us bubbles don't, don't exist. Um, so, maybe it's because of my ignorance of Marx, but I am willing to give those classical economists enough of benefit of doubt to say that they must be right, at least at some of the accounts, because, literally, you cannot throw this much poo on any wall for, it, for none of it to stick. It's just, you know, physically impossible. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, speaker? I, sorry, I partly wanted to ask a question about climate change um, because Nicholas Stern said, you know, climate change is the greatest free, you know, market failure in history. And at the moment, if we continue as we are, we're almost certainly going to go above 2 degrees centigrade and according to the head of the metro meteorological office, currently we are going to go for 4.6 degrees centigrade rise, which will devastate large parts of the world and large parts of the world population. Now, one of the alternatives put forward in this country and other countries is arguing about, say, for example, a million climate jobs, uh, argue for vastly increased state intervention in terms of new electricity grids, housing, etc., and I'd really like to hear from Michael Roberts his take on if we could mobilise enough people to force the state to intervene as they, we have to if we're going to avoid serious, dangerous climate change. We have to get the state involved because the free market cannot actually solve the problem. What does he think the economic implications are? Thank you, Comrade. Thank you. The next comrade will be followed by that gentleman there. I, I would like to state that, the, for, for me, I think the start of the crisis that of, of the neoliberal era, I think, began in, in the early 70s with the end of, of, of the post-war economic boom. Um, and I agree with Pil Kitty on that. I think that was <clears throat> the period when, actually, neoliberalism um, ideology was introduced as a strategy by the ruling class in the Western countries in order to restore the rate of profit. Um, and if we have seen what's happened in the last 40 years, we have seen, say, in the United States, real wages stagnating. We've seen that, you know, we were promised 40 years ago that uh, we would be into, into the era of leisure, but actually workers are working longer hours for, you know, the same or less pay. The level of exploitation of workers has gone up and if we look at say the last four or five years we talk about crisis but we also need to talk about class war as well because for the ruling class it's not been a crisis for them they haven't felt it in fact the number of billionaires in the UK has increased 
Um, so from a, purely the question of class war, this is fine. And uh, this situation will just... I don't see this thing... Um, you know, I don't see the crisis in itself um, end, ending, ending the, the system. I also see there's a problem for us, a problem for the left, is that one of the, in order to actually fight and resist, uh, we can't simply say we need to abolish capitalism because it's just such a big system. We need to be concrete. We need to be putting forward concrete demands. Say, for instance, uh, we want to uh, oppose neoliberalism. We want to stop the privatisation of the NHS. We want to spend more money on health. We want to spend more money on education. That means increasing public expenditure. And the Keynesian argument fits with the idea of increasing public expenditure. And then if we are really purists, we can say, oh, well, that's not going to solve the economic crisis because you're putting forward Keynesian economic demand. So I think, you know, this analysis creates, creates problems for us because uh, we have to be, we can't be abstract when we're fighting and resisting um, austerity. And so uh, the question is, then what concretely do we say to, to organise resistance? Do we just say that, you know, all the Keynesians are rubbish when they talk about increasing, you know, uh, welfare and how and building you know building schools and, and hospitals and all this, the things we want. Oh, thanks, comrade. The comrade at the front here, before by that woman. Yeah, thank you. I just want to pick up the question of how how does the current long depression come to an end? Uh, I I remember what. 20-something years ago, that in Japan there had been something called a high-tech boom, which then turned itself into what I think they called a Zytec boom, which was the Japanese for financialization, for basically a manipulation of, of, the, of the financial system, if you want to call it that, which produced the most astonishing property boom to the point where, you know, Tokyo real estate was the most valuable in the world. That crashed in a way that uh, brought, I think, the stock exchange down to a third of its value, and it's remained more or less at that level, third, for the last 25 years or so. Maybe it's 35 years now. And the question is, if the Japanese, and obviously, Eber, the current Prime Minister is trying to get Japan out of that hole again by the most vast amounts of uh, public spending and all kinds of other manipulation, I would suggest that it isn't working and that there is no way in which you can really see anything other than the slow, incredibly painful destruction of existing indebtedness as a way to actually bring some kind of recovery. And it seems to me, boarding on the stage, you know, on the extreme optimism that we can anticipate this going on for such a long period of time without enormous tensions across the globe in a world which still remains incredibly full of weaponry and mass destruction and all the rest of it. You, know, you look at what's happening in, in, the, you know, in, in the Western Pacific at the moment, in the rise of China as a major military force, and you ask yourself, just how long can you see uh, a peaceful resolution of the conflicts, you know, if you can call it that, continuing? And my fear is that we are in a race against time, basically. Thanks, comrade. The next speaker will be followed by that gentleman there. I just wanted to ask two things, really. First of all, about the neoliberal recovery that you mentioned from 1983 to 1995. You mentioned, are you mentioning that as a diff something different to capitalism? Is it not just a capitalist recovery? That's one question. And secondly, you mentioned the cause of it as being new technology, main, partly new technology. But was it not also about, and again, this is a question, was it not greater levels of exploitation um, which brings in much more the social relations of things. So that's one thing. Second thing is the present crisis, because where I come from in Ireland, the politics of the present crisis is just so important. I mean, they have managed to convince us that the debt is a sovereign debt. I mean, this word is extraordinary when it's a private debt. You know, it's an incredible... Uh, you know, it's a horrible ideology, basically. And so could you say that the crisis is going to go on much, much longer and in a way that is important to counter the ruling class argument that we're all just around the corner to recovery? But don't we also actually have to challenge the contradiction of austerity and say it isn't our, you know, we, we have to bring in the politics of that and expose that, that this is a banking crisis, it's going to start and end with the banks, and we have to take it on in that way. In other words, politics can make their crisis much more severe, and maybe we should be doing that as well. Thanks, comrade. 
There's room for one more contribution. If anyone... Oh, all the hands go up. Okay. Yeah, John Pines in Oxford. Yeah, I had a question about China, because on this graph here, it says it excludes China. And um, one of the things that's always appealed to me about the Socialist Worker Party view of uh, economics is that it, it can explain uh, what's happening in the, what used to be called socialist countries, just as in the, our own country. And, and clearly I can see that, that there are the same pressures must apply in a country like China. Um, I've heard about the fact that the economy may be overheating. We hear about a bubble there maybe as well. What's been inspiring is seeing actually workers fighting back there in some really quite inspiring ways and winning in many cases. Um, but, but also, on the other hand, it has been associated with a very kind of dynamic phase. I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist. We scrabble around for, for research funds at the moment, and yet you see in China they're putting money into stem cells, into genetics, into all sorts of things. So I just wonder if you could say more about how that sort of fits into the, the world situation. Thanks, comrade. And the final contribution would be from the guy who waved his hand at me. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. It's been another depression by the time I've got from here to here. <laughs> uh, there are enormous uh, political implications to all this, of course, because if, if the long boom in the 1950s and 1960s was as a result of Keynesian economics... Um, that's, that's one thing. Of course, there's a different argument related to deep, deep things inside the system which could produce that long boom, which you can't go into. But there's another side to that which is extremely important now for debates about what a future Labour government might hold. There's huge debates inside of the People's Assembly, uh, certain sections of left unity, the uh, le red Labour inside the Labour Party itself, all to do with whether or not the application of neo-Keynesianism, new forms of Keynesian economics, can pull the system round so that uh, uh, investment through government can save the NHS, for example, or um, fund a new wave of council house spending. So this is all really important uh, stuff. I don't pretend to uh, understand it all, but it seems to me that there is a real problem because if a lot of people's hopes trade union leadership, certain sections of the Labour Party, are resting on the idea of investment through government into, say, public services. Where is that money going to come from? Well, through the raising of taxes. Where is that going to come from? Either from working class people or from getting it out of the pockets of the rich. Great, taking it out of the pockets of the rich, but is any future Labour government going to be doing that? In other words, I think that there is a real crisis inside of the whole political establishment, which was at one time based on the idea of social democracy and in investment. In other, in other words, I think that we are in for a massive battle over how and who is going to be held responsible in the future for the crisis. This isn't going to go away, whoever gets elected, in 2015. So we have to be prepared not only to fight to defend our interests and fight to defend the NHS and so on, but also be in a position to explain as precisely as we can who is responsible for this crisis. And that means understanding all this sort of stuff and getting your head around it, because it, these, this argument will erupt it will erupt inside of the working class once Labour gets elected and, as I pr would predict, is not going to be able to solve the economic crisis and is going to continue largely to make us pay for it. So we have to be prepared, we have to understand this sort of stuff and we have to be prepared to fight back whoever gets elected. Thanks, comrade. If you did leave out North Korea, I think somebody did. Um, let me start with the banks because... A number of comrades have raised the point of that um, this crisis was in the banking sector. The banks made huge profits, speculated with everybody's money, lent each other fictitious amounts of money, and then the whole thing came crashing down. In that sense, Ben Bernanke was right. It was a financial panic that uh, uh, triggered uh, the Great Recession um, from 2007 onwards. And as one comrade said, at the end of it, the whole point about austerity is that, we're, that the, the rulers of our, and the capitalist governments now, having bailed out the banks with taxpayers' money or by increasing the sovereign debt or government debt that we all have to pay in our taxes uh, and so on, says it's, we have to get this debt down. And it's, everybody's got to tighten their belts in order to do that, in order, in other words, to uh, bail out the banks and let them continue just as they were before. And as we know, um, most of the executives on those banks have not lost their jobs. Hardly anybody 
was arrested, and virtually, I think, only one person has been convicted. Of course, there's been a lot of fines in the last two or three years. Uh, and even every week now, another bank is being fined billions of dollars uh, for various sort of laundering activities. Um, I won't go down the list. I still can't get over the fact that HSBC was involved in laundering Mexican uh, uh, drug money uh, for several years, and uh, when it was found out, um, got a very minuscule fine from the US authorities. If that had happened in the UK, they would have got no fine at all. Nothing would have happened whatsoever. And yet, what has happened is that the debt of governments across the world in the major economies has massively, massively increased. So uh, that private debt diagram I show, that Comrade pointed out, has been why it's called sovereign debt. It's all gone from them over to us. Uh, and now we have to service this debt through uh, higher interest rates that the government pays and therefore has to charge on taxes. And therefore, that means all the bits which actually be useful from government uh, like welfare and so on, are being cut. Of course, ideologically, uh, many governments want to cut that anyway, but they're also faced with the burden of having bailed out the banks to do so. And when we're talking about the state intervening to save uh, the economy from the crisis uh, and the slump, well, the state's intervened to save the banks. It hasn't saved the economy much. Uh, and in fact, I see no state investment going on. One of the features of the collapse of investment since 2007 has been the absolute collapse of any government investment. An American engineer's report pointed out that virtually all American roads have not literally collapsed. Um, and, and we know about the pothole things, but it's not just that. It's the whole range of things and infrastructure spending that could have gone on uh, using the resources to develop the, the uh, people's needs rather than to provide, to have to now service the debt to bail out banks which continue to exist in more or less the same form as they are, apart from mergers that take place with the ones that they had to let go bust. Um, some of them, for example, JP Morgan, I shouldn't be spending all this time on this, but it annoys me. Uh, JP Morgan got uh, uh, one of the big American banks for one dollar. Uh, uh, that's, that's how uh, n nicely it was arranged uh, to sort out the repositioning of the big uh, uh, banks. Too big to fail. Well, apparently not too big to fail. Uh, they've all been allowed to continue at our expense. And so that means that things like state inf investment haven't really played a role in ameliorating the crisis. Um, one of the, the, the main way in which the crisis has been ameliorated is a huge increase in credit injections by the central banks which have been gone into the banks in order to provide to keep them going so that they can continue to lend. But of course, when you have a slump, most those people who are small businesses can't borrow. They're, the banks don't want to lend them and they can't borrow on the terms that are being offered. And the very big businesses have got huge amounts of cash and don't need to borrow from the banks. In fact, what the big companies like uh, the big American ones like Apple and so on have been doing, they've been stashing up all their profits abroad, which is about the hedge fund thing, all the money's gone into places where you don't pay so much tax, and then they've been issuing debt bonds at home, uh, although they've got the cash to invest, uh, and issuing a, a debt to get more cash. And what have they done with the cash? Not investing in, uh, even in their own industry. What they've been done, doing is buying their own shares back so that the price goes up or paying out higher dividends. So most of this extra money that's been squeezed out of us uh, in the recovery has gone to speculate uh, further. And as other comrades have pointed out, if they continue with that process, they're not really, as it were, cleansing the capitalist economy for its own benefit. They're, they're sustaining a position where profitability in the productive sectors remains low, and therefore there'll be no growth. We'll not get back to the levels of trend growth. They'll not be able to replace all the unemployed people sufficiently to create uh, uh, anywhere le near the level of employment that existed before the crisis. In the case of the UK, as has been pointed out, uh, employment here uh, hasn't been, didn't severely fall quite so far as in other countries. But what you've got is a load of industries, which are companies, which are basically have been described as zombie companies. All that, all that they do is that they keep on their staff and they just make just enough money to pay the debt that they've got. And the interest rates are so low, so they can do that. But they have no money at all to grow the economy, to invest the economy. And they also, they try to, the most importantly across the board, people are going, yes, people may have jobs, but they're not full-time permanent jobs with pensions and with all the other things. They're part-time, or they're temporary, or they're zero hours, or they're 
casual in all the old ways that used to exist before uh, workers and trade unions established uh, uh, better conditions for the labour market. Uh, what we've got now is a situation of precariousness for a whole millions of workers in the UK and across uh, the advanced countries. That's the nature of this depression. Uh, yes, there's employment for, in some countries. Uh, in the case of Spain, of course, has a completely different situation. And in, in the periphery, where such is the depth of the depression, remember that the Greek economy ha and, and its people have seen a reduction in the, in the period since the Great Recession of 40% in real terms of that economy. It's been completely crushed. And uh, it's now only, it, it has now a massive uh, sovereign debt, which will never, ever be paid. So all that the Germans will do is keep saying, well, yes, you owe us the money, but it's all right, don't pay it now. And that'll go on forever uh, to keep them inside the Eurozone and maintain it. But that economy is crushed. It's going to take God knows how long, if, if it ever does, recover to, to anything like where it was before. This is what the, this uh, depression is producing and why it's not recovering. And as the comrades have pointed out, it's not going to recover if wages, because of, uh, of increased cuts in wages to boost profits, that's already been done. Profits as a share of GDP in the US are at record highs. They have never been higher. Companies are loaded up with cash. But still, the economy in the US, which is the best of the major seven economies, can grow no, no more than 2%. In the last quarter, it actually fell 2% because of the winter. It was a bad winter. Uh, Maybe that's right, but it's still not going to grow much more than 2% this year. 2%, 2%. Now, the average rate of the GDP growth of the U.S. since the Second World War is 3.3%. So if you think about it, that's a 40% fall in the rate of growth. Now, you may say 3% to 2%, what the hell does that matter? That's not, nothing at all. But over 40, 50, 60, 70 years, it makes a huge difference to the living standards of everybody. As one comrade pointed out, Keynes said in 1931, and when addressing his students, his Cambridge students, because he was worried that they're all going to adopt Marxist ideas in the Great Depression. He was very worried about that. So he called all his students and gave them a lecture. And he said, yeah, I know it's bad. But don't worry. Technology, this system works. In, by the time you're 60 or my age, you'll all be working a 15-hour week. The incomes will have risen dramatically. There'll be a leisure. The problem will be a problem of leisure, not the problem of hard work or finding a job. Well, um, there's certainly a lot of leisure around for some. Uh, but it's not, I'm afraid, uh, achieved that task. Yes. Incomes and GDP have risen across capitalism since Keynes made that speech in 1931. But that's, he was only thinking about modern capitalism. What about the whole of the world? What about the inequalities in the world, which remain dramatic? What about the level of poverty remains in the world? What about the level of unemployment? None of those things. He didn't even address that. Uh, his idea of, of capitalism and the economy was simply Britain, America, and Europe. He didn't Never imagined it took in anything else. He didn't discuss inequality in that speech. He didn't discuss the rest of the world, nothing. At least now we have global capitalism. We certainly do with a vengeance, and we have to consider it on a global basis now. We can't just look at those uh, top seven countries and say that solves, uh, we'll, we'll understand what's going on. Because we have, as one comrade raised the question of China, absolutely vital question to understand what is going to happen with China, which is the economy which has not really suffered from this great recession which has continued to grow at 7, 8, 10%, uh, which has increased its inequality. All kinds of interesting thoughts we have to discuss. No time to do that now. Uh, but it's, it is an issue which uh, comrades have got to consider because it doesn't fit into the pattern of the Great Recession in the, the way that we've seen it. So we're not going to get a change through cutting wages or through the state investing more. The, the capitalists have cut wages. The state hasn't invested more. It, it wouldn't solve the problem anyway. In fact, by cutting wages, increasing profits, and just spending it on speculation, they're perpetuating this depression. There's got to be, a, as some of the more right-wing Austrian economists say, got to be a good cleansing out, liquidating of everything, so that we get a real lean, mean machine, as the phrase, that really can grow, much more profitable, get rid of all the dead wood. But it's all zombie. There's still too much zombie stuff in there, which is not allowing the economy to go forward. Uh, uh, on a capitalist basis. So that remains the problem for capitalism. And of course, if they see it like that and the policy move, they have no, move towards yet another slump, then we really are 
beginning to see the impact of what capitalism means, not just for uh, the third world, as it used to be called, but for, for, for all the so-called modern uh, world where we all have 15-hour weeks. Um, let me finish on this point about climate change and what's going to happen over the next 50 years. There's, again, this is a major issue which of, uh, has to be considered, that even if they come out of this slump, in fact, by coming out of the slump and moving to a new period of faster growth, if that's going to happen, that will increase the danger of global warming, not reduce it, because capitalism is rapacious in destroying natural resources, and it has no, there's no possibility of, a, of controlling global warming and turning around the environmental crisis which is developing globally under capitalism. It's not possible. It won't happen because there's no attempt on the path of profit-seeking companies and institutions to turn it around. So it won't happen. Let me finish on this. The OECD has produced a report just a couple of weeks ago of where things are going to be in 2060. And they deal with growth, they deal with climate change, they deal with inequality. It's staggering. It might as well have been written by a lefty. I mean, it's, it's just awful. And Paul Mason wrote a very good article in The Guardian which summarised it, and comrades should read that because they could, if they don't want to read 75 pages of the grass, that's what I do, um, then, then they, they can see that the capitalists themselves rec recognise that there is no prospect of change around the major problems of the world. But they will carry on regardless because they just have to make profit. And they will not consider the question of actually solving the issues facing humanity over the next 50 years.